<laughs> so thank you guys. First, I wanted to thank Dr. Fulton, Taffy, and the Dolliver family, Kyle and Katie and Ryan, for hosting this. As a lot of you guys know, I think I'm like over half of your kids' doctor. Um, <laughs> um, we've been trying to get this community together for years, and you know, there's one person here and one person here and one person here, and it's, everyone's got busy kids, and it's always really challenging. And I'm so thankful to the persistence of the Dolliver family for organizing this meeting, get everyone, getting everyone here, and of course getting Dr. Shelvin and Dr. Byers here. That's amazing, you know. <laughs> Most of what I know, almost 99% of what I know about vascular DS I learned from Dr. Byers so, and his writings, and so I'm, I'm so honored to have, to have them here. And thank you guys for actually being here. And as you guys know, really the experts in the room are you. Um, I mean, there are a few people who know about vascular EDS, but as you know, if you've been to any emergency room or to your pediatrician, you know most, most of you know more than they do about vascular EDS. And you have to take it on your shoulders to be the expert, to say, you know, this isn't the same as hypermobile EDS. This is different. This is not the same. I'm not one of those super bendy, flexible people that you, you know, has a lot of these issues and you can blow off. This is a serious disease. And I, I thank you for being here, for educating yourself more, although I know most of you are, at least everyone that I take care of is very, very educated. And I, I so appreciate working with families. Everyone is so motivated. Um, so anyways, that's just some thank yous to you guys and to thank you for being here. And I'll just talk a few minutes sort of about what I see our role is and my role. So I'm a pediatric cardiologist. So um, I work at Texas Children's Hospital and I take care of kids I, I co-direct our cardiovascular genetics clinic, and so I take care of kids who have genetic disorders that cause heart disease. And the way I got into this is when I was in college, so many, many years ago, I wanted to be a geneticist, and I worked in a lab of a Dr. Uta Franca, who is a, a geneticist who works on Marfan syndrome. You guys have probably heard of Marfan syndrome. It's much more common. And I started doing work with her, and I really found it fascinating. And basically, through the course of, course of years, I started taking care of kids with Marfan syndrome, and then that turned into other vascular disorders, and now, um, now basically all I see at Texas Children's is kids with arterial and aortic problems, problems of the arteries, where we are worried they're going to have a bad event. And of course that includes vascular EDS. And I think I follow, a, you know, not nearly as many as, as they do over the course of the years, but longitudinally I follow 15 to 20 kids right now, and then as they go older they go over to adult cardiologists. But more importantly than that, you know, I think one thing that I love serving the role is, is having a longitudinal doctor. I think there's lots of geneticists who will diagnose this condition, but then they don't follow you. There are some geneticists that do, which is wonderful. And like Dr. Shelby is a surgeon who follows kids longitudinally. That's very rare, or follows people longitudinally. And I sort of take that on as my role, as yes, I'm a, a cardiologist, but I'm really ultimately turned into being a primary care doctor. You know, what, are, are you doing okay? Are we getting the right surveillance? What do you need? I think most of my families have my cell phone for when they're in the ER and someone says, I don't know what this is. The family tells me they need a CAT scan. Is that real? You know? <laughs> um, and so, and I really take that job seriously. Um, and I think that's how, how kids and adults with vascular EDS are going to be better. If you're knowledgeable, you know what to do, you know how to prevent outcomes, at least for what we know now. The other way, other than seeing myself, and I think everyone needs this person, whether it's a pediatricologist or a surgeon or a geneticist, other than having a longitudinal doctor, is advocating for change. So we know only how to diagnose vascular EDS right now. Okay, we know very little about risk stratification. We know a little bit by genetics, but it's not enough for someone like me to look at you and say, oh, you're going to be bad, you're going to be good, I'm going to change my management. I don't think we're there yet. And my goal, and I hope your goal too, but this is 75% of, of my time technically is on research. That doesn't really happen, but I try, <laughs> um, is to first is to, to improve lives of kids with aortic and arterial disease. And there's sort of three steps on that. First, we need to learn how to risk stratify. Who's more mild? Who's more severe? Who can we not have to see every year? Who can we not have to freak the families out so much? And who's more severe? And we need to be a lot more aggressive. So first, risk stratification. This is personalized medicine, right? The next is, okay, if we have high-risk patients, how do we take better care of them? What do we do that's correct? And if we have low-risk patients, how do we not have them pay so much in medical cost? How do we have them not have to come so much? How do we not have to have them so paranoid that the family has crazy anxiety that every time they fall down, we all have to panic? You know, how, do we, how can we reassure families? And the third is preventing. Like, how do we actually modify these, these patients that are severe? How do we make them more mild? And I think it's going to take us many years to get there, and I'm still working on that risk stratification. How can I look at a three-year-old and say, oh, I can see every five years, or oh, I need to see in six months? Do we need to image you? Do, how often do we need MRIs or CTs? Do, you know, do, are the meds helping or not? 
you know, can we, is there something as we're giving you meds, we know that kids have very few uh, events. Some kids do have events, but it's much less common than adults. But is there a way we can, other than saying, you didn't have an event this year, I guess you're good. Is there in a way of monitoring in between? Like some of the research work we're doing is looking at the arterial walls. Like has, has it become less stiff? Is it more stiff? Is it more elastic? Is it more strong? Does the MRI look like the recoil is better? Can we use some of those proxy measures to say, oh, the medicines are working, or age is working, I mean, age is making you better, or age is making you worse. And I think, unfortunately, we're so in the infancy of this condition, it's great that we know what it is, it's great that everyone's been diagnosed, but how do we really change outcomes? And that's sort of the whole goal of like what I do, period. And I think that, that it helps by seeing families like you that are so motivated and so eager and so uh, willing to contribute information to help us to help us learn. So I look forward to meeting those of you I don't know <laughs> today and, um, and spending more time with those of you that I, that I do. So thanks, guys. And, and happy to take any questions. So. <laughs> and we can do it on the panel if there's specific you know, questions later about imaging and following up and what to do about kids and stuff. I, so it was sort of funny. I wanted to be a geneticist. I was really inspired by Dr. Franca, and I worked in another lab, a guy named uh, uh, Deepak Srivastava, who's a really famous um, pediatric cardiologist. W but what happened is I went, to, I went to med school wanting to be a geneticist, and I was an MD-PhD, so a physician scientist. I actually quit my PhD, so don't, Dr. Byers, don't be mad at me. <laughs> but um, I, was a, uh, I was in this doctor's lab, Dr. Srivastava, who's, a P who's an MD, a medical doctor, but who ran a lab. And I was doing experiments for him, and he's like, oh, do you want to, you know, you're in med school, do you want to come to clinic with me? And I had never been to clinic, like, I'd never seen patients, I'd been in college. And um, he started taking me to clinic, and uh, I started seeing patients with heart disease, and I was like, oh, this is fun. Like, DNA is okay, but, like, this is really fun. And so, uh, ultimately, I quit my PhD, and I went exactly in his footsteps as a pediatric cardiologist, but I always had that love of genetics. So, ever, even though I went down the pediatric cardiology path through med school, through residency, through fellowship, I always was in the genetics clinic, in the cardiac genetics clinic, and then when I became faculty at Baylor, the person who ran the genetics clinic had just left, so I took it over. So, and and the specifically arteriopathy, all the other genetic diseases, we sort of dispersed out to other groups, and I took over the vascular disorders. So, so you're at Baylor? I'm at Baylor, yes, sir. At, P at Texas Children's, which is the pediatric part of Baylor, then there's adult Baylor, which is right across the street. Can you uh, evaluate everybody on, on beta blockers? And sure, I'm happy, what we know, sure. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so beta blockers. All right, so the, this kind of stems sort of from Marfan syndrome theory, starting from the beginning. So we know Marfan syndrome is a lot, lot more common. And we think there's some pretty reasonable research to say that if you give patients with Marfan syndrome, this is older research, beta blockers are going to have less dissections. And theoretically, slowing your heart rate, decreasing stress in your aorta might decrease events. And the thought was, well, does that apply to patients with vascular EDS? So there was a trial done in Europe several years ago, and it w but we didn't really know if beta blockers help, and it was with a specific beta blocker called saliprolol, which doesn't, we don't have here in the US, but it seemed to have the right kind of properties on your adrenaline system to sort of be the most optimal beta blocker. And because we didn't know, they said you either got placebo or you got a beta blocker, and they followed these patients and said, let's follow these patients for a few years, and let's see who has events and who doesn't, and are there people on beta blockers have less events. Now, a few limitations of that trial. Um, not everyone had been genetically tested. They had been clinically diagnosed with vascular EDS. Um, and we know that a lot of people with Lois Dietz actually had a diagnosis of vascular EDS before. But um, anyways, in that trial, before the trial was even supposed to be done, they showed in the arm that had a, the beta blocker that there was a lot less events, a lot less lethal events, a lot less major medical events. And they actually had to stop the trial early because the, it looked like the benefit was so large to have less events that, um, that beta blocker for sure won. So for now, that's the only study that's been done sort of in a rigorous way looking at a beta blockers versus nothing. There were some limitations. There's a lot of questions about this trial. Maybe not everyone had vascular EDS. Let's look at the outcomes. It's one study. We almost never make decisions on one study. The problem is that this is such a lethal disease. Beta blockers are really well tolerated. It's really hard now for people who know about this trial to sort of what we say have equipoise, to say, well, I don't, I don't believe in it, 
so not do it. So no one is really willing to do a trial because no one wants to be randomized to the placebo group anymore. Um, and so anyways, there's this debate. Now the issues are, um, Dr. Dietz, as you know, or maybe you guys don't know, Dr. Dietz is a geneticist who does a lot of work with Marfan syndrome and Lois Dietz syndrome, which is in a kind of different molecular pathway. But he is a big advocate of a medication called Losartan, which is also seems to help prevent dissections in those group of patients. So there's also been some translation of does that medicine help prevent dissections? So right now there's this, we're all a little bit up in the air of like, Soliprolol is the only one that sort of it has evidence that it decreases events, which is a beta blocker. Losartan maybe theoretically, and then maybe nothing. We don't really know. Now with the beta blockers, I, I personally figure, I think there could be effective beta blockers. It's very low side effects. If it can help, fabulous. So I, all of my patients are on beta blockers. Um, but we don't have Soliprolol. We don't have anything quite like Soliprolol. So we use ones that are available in the US. So that's sort of the status. I just talked to someone from the UK yesterday. And they have, most people in Europe, I think, use Soliprolol. They were using Losartan. And then there's some people who use nothing still. So that's sort of the data we know. But I certainly have all my patients on beta blockers. They're super well tolerated in children. And um, there are very few side effects. And if it can help prevent event, great. I, but I don't think we have awesome evidence <coughs> that it prevents events. But I think if anything helps. Now, if I'll go and talk about the ACER, what's going on, if you guys want me mm -hmm. to talk about that. Is this an OK forum? Can I ask you something? Oh. OK, so if, if you're on a beta blocker, but your blood pressure is run low, mm -hmm. does that affect blood pressure? Does beta blocker? Beta blocker is a blood pressure medicine. Um, the thing is, it actually doesn't affect your blood pressure <laughs> tremendously okay. if your blood pressure <laughs> is normal. It actually much more likely lowers your heart rate. So our goal and we're on beta block is to reduce your heart rate by about 20 points. Like I'd like to, I like to say teenagers and adults with heart rates in the 60s and younger kids, 70s, or really young kids, 80s, 90s. Um, and you, most people tolerate it fine. I mean, if your blood pressure is super, super low, you may not tolerate it. But more often, people who have a low heart rate don't tolerate it. I mean, someone, if someone comes in and they're in the 50s, like they're an athlete, I probably won't put them on a beta blocker. But, um, but it doesn't, it, Losartan definitely lowers your blood pressure. So, but it has less effects on your blood pressure. Did, I was going to come in a little bit. Is this an okay time to talk about the Acer thing? Um, so there is a company called Acer that's trying to get Soliprolol to the U.S. They're an or, they're a um, and they're not a venture capitalist, but they're trying to basically make it an orphan drug to be available in the U.S. to for patients with vascular EDS, which would be great. And I think they're making good progress. There is a little. So again, we don't know if this is a, a great drug, but it'd be great to have it and even do a trial with Soliprolol head to head with another beta blocker. Um, there is an issue because vascular EDS is so rare and it's such a small community that um, the, my understanding is the business model right now is to charge quite a bit for the medicine. And so we have to see how that um, pans out and maybe the Dolliver, they actually met with Acer and can comment on that for their, how that's going to work. But we're waiting to see how that, how that plays out. We, we actually have an Acer representative in our... Oh, great. Wonderful. <laughs> what, is, what is Acer? Is it a beta blocker too? Oh, no, sorry. I'm sorry. Acer is a company that um, is trying to bring Soliprolol to the U.S. Okay, so is that, is that a beta blocker too? It, no, Soliprolol is the beta blocker that was used in the trial. And so what they're doing is trying to get... How does it differentiate from the beta blocker that you're using? That we're using now? Well, it's a specific alpha agonist and, and beta... And, or, sorry, beta, alpha antagonist and beta agonist, but it has specific effects that seem a little better on the peripheral vascular system than other beta blockers. Theoretically, that's why they chose it. So, um, it's more, more specific. More specific, uh, theoretically. When it was chosen, it was said, well, we think this might have the best effects. So, um, and so they're they trying. Really done any testing on it. Well, they did this trial, but it was it was Soliprolol versus nothing. So we don't know. We have it's never been run head to head with other beta blockers. Never been run head to head with a Losartan. So we don't know if in people if it's that different. And certainly, Dr. Barrett can comment differently when. You're here, or you guys. <laughs> but um, as far as I know. Yeah. How does that affect people? How does Soliprolol affect people? I, I haven't taken care of anyone on Soliprolol. Mm -hmm. So my understandings, though, are that it's pretty similar to other beta blockers, that it primarily, you know, the effects you see in people are lowering the heart rate. So. But you also said something to the effect that it also affects their, um, their, um, what do you call it? What you call it? Where your, um, your, your energy level, I call it um, the heart rate. Huh? The heart rate? Well, not just the, the heart rate, but your uh, metabolism and yeah. stuff like that. I how mean, does that affect that? how does it affect? Because I'm looking at, when, cause when you take certain things, yep. they slow you down. When they slow you down, it slows your, it slows everything down. I right. mean, it doesn't just slow one thing down. 
because everything has a counter effect across right. the body. Right. That's true. I mean, most people, like, I, I probably care for 150 kids on beta blockers for VDS and a lot of other reasons. I mean, most, at least children, people, up, I have kids up to 22, tolerate it really, really well. The heart rate is definitely slower, and often the first few days you, you feel that. People can tell their heartbeat is beating slower and stronger. But in general, they are active, they're playful, they do well in school. You know, I have maybe 5% that come and say, oh, I just didn't really like it. I did it for two or three weeks and it didn't feel right. And then we take them off or we lower the dose. But in general, you know, we don't have people coming in and say, oh, I'm super constipated. I mean, there's a very small percentage that get low blood sugar. I've never had that happen in my clinic. It's usually itty bitty babies. Um, but it's pretty well tolerated overall. Other questions? Hey. I guess it's between 15 and 20 right now. Yeah. Yeah, it used to. Yeah. Yeah, you. Of your patients, you were talking about events. Uh huh. Do you know about our events? Yes. How many of your patients have had events? Just two that have had events at a very young age, you guys, and then one other who is a patient I care for that is not here, is in Florida, who had a dissection, who had a vertebral artery dissection and a stroke. Actually, I have another patient in Utah um, with a vertebral artery, but they were, they're, how old are they? They're a teenager. And then, can I mention what happened? Or I won't. Okay, um, never mind. Yeah, you can oh, you can talk. It, I'll let you guys decide if you want to share that or not. It's, it's okay. Like, you know, we're private people. Yes, so I, I won't mention it, but yes. Okay, you're okay. We're here with, I think, family, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's okay. Are you, are you sure? Yeah, I was just curious because we've been, yeah. Go ahead. It's a, I will let you you're decide okay. during the conference. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, their son, um, who has a more severe form, you know, easy bru bru bruising and easy bleeding, uh, was just running out, was, had a toy and had to run to the restroom, right? And had to, had to, was urgently going to the restroom, s uh, tripped over a toy and had a bladder rupture. And so, which was very, very scary. Um, and very scary because then you come to the ER, you have to do a repair, that's a surgery. We all know how big, and it was like a Friday night. I know I wasn't even in the hospital. I was like on the phone with the urologist who didn't even know what vascular EDS was. <laughs> and um, really, really scary scary. Um, fortunately, he did great. But um, they had to make a lot of, they'd made a lot of changes to the way they had him recover and such, and he did well, but it's super scary. Now, I'm getting teary. It was like super scary for all of us. So, um, but we're lucky that most, you know, events in kids are pretty uncommon, but um, it certainly, certainly can happen. If I had made some slides, but it seemed like better in this environment not to have them, but I have a, a beautiful survival curve created by Dr. Byers and his group that sort of shows when you start having events, and it's certainly not T it, although they are reported in those first 10 to 15 years of life is very un very uncommon and they start getting much more common after that. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, can you sh share to us with us what some of the progressions are with um, EDS? Because like, you know, if you haven't, if you've had a dissection, if you've had aneurysms, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that we should be looking at that will come about? Well, if you've had, I mean. Because I, I, I have EDS. Oh, you, okay. Okay, and I'm trying to figure out what, are, what is my progression going to be, and what's life going to be like for me? Because I'm looking. I've already had, I've already had aneurysm. I've had my aorta redone. I've had my EBX redone, and I, I don't know. I, I also know that I've had. I got five more aneurysms in me right now, and so I'm looking. Yeah. Sorry. I'm trying to figure. trying to figure out what's next. Yeah, that's so, it's so scary, and I, and I wish we could say more. I mean, the problem with this disease to date is that a lot of it has been, this is what we do for this community, you know, and we really, really, I mean, I know what you, or, I hear it a lot, you guys may not hear a lot, but we really need to move towards personalized medicine. Like, we don't know if you take someone who's already survived a dissection and survived a surgery, what's going to happen. My guess would actually be that you're probably in a slightly bet at your age that you've survived these, you're probably in a slightly better pool because some people don't survive that at all. Um, and so, you know, we sort of say these things with infants. If you've made it to 12 months, you're probably a lot likely to make it a lot longer. Um, but we don't know. We need to have better models, better understanding. If we say, this is my age, this is my genotype, this is my genetic mutation, this is my wall stiffness, this is what my MRI looks like, this is what I can see as my future. But we don't have enough patients and we haven't had the right, I don't think, the right people doing modeling, you know, predictive, that, that's, what, that's where I come in. I am not, I am not a geneticist, I am not a molecular biologist, but I do a lot of statistical modeling. And, and we, how can we take all this data we know and predict 
And, and unfortunately, I don't think, I mean, maybe these guys know better than me, but I don't think we're very good at all of taking someone's unique situation and saying, how, how is it going to be? Um, we can say it could, this could happen, or this could happen, or this could happen, or this could happen. But knowing in each of those categories, um, the chance that, I mean, again, maybe they can come better than me, but it's hard for me to say. And I'm, I, and I'm, I'm so sorry. And I'm happy to take names and contact information of anyone that wants to join our study. We have an imaging biomarker study. We have, it, we have both patients from TCH and patients from the Gentech Consortium. So we have, I think, 65 people with VEDS in it right now and that, have, that have full imaging. Um, but we, take, we look at the imaging. We sort of create sort of a data model from the imaging and any serial imaging and echoes. And, and we're trying to predict who's going to have outcomes. So. Would these patients have to come to Houston to you? They don't. Ideally, or they come. their doctors send you? You can join in any way. We can do a medical record only join where we just get the images and we get the, the data entry. If you come to Houston, we also do other vascular testing. We get blood, we take images, so we make sure all the physical features are the, the same. Like we've said, oh, all these features are the same versus your doctor saying it. And then we, um, and we also do some vascular stiffness testing that we do in the lab, but we're happy if you can't come all the way to Houston, we're happy to have you enroll distally. We, all, we have a mechanism to do that too. Okay? All right, thank you guys. Thank you.